Why? Why couldn't I have let it die with V3? Why? Oh. Um. <clears throat> right, um. Uh, let's get this underway then, shall we? <sighs> and here I thought the joke was on you guys. Turns out I always forgot who the true clown of this channel was. That being said, Danganronpa another. This fan game duology was developed by an individual from Korea, with the intent purpose of destroying any and all sense of happiness I still had left after Ken and Danganronpa in your turn to die. Their name is Lineuge, and I'll be referring to them as the mastermind behind the biggest, most awful, most tragic event within my fucking mind. Despite this game not coming from the mind of Kazutaka Kodaka, I honestly find its writing and implementation to be good enough to enter it in the canon timeline of events of the Danganronpa universe. That, in its turn, also means its characters are some of its strongest suits. The cast of Danganronpa and other is nothing short of colorful. Upon my first meeting with them, I was heavily reminded of Danganronpa 2's cast. And today, we take a look at my 10 favorite members of said cast. <sighs> Fine. 11 favorite members of said cast. Yeah, there's another tie in the mix, but this one's justified, trust me. It'll make all the sense in the world when we reach that entry. I don't feel like this is needed all that much, but better safe than sorry, so... Obvious spoiler warning is obvious. Major story details of Danganronpa Another and the original series will be discussed in this countdown. For those of you who know how the story goes, strap in and get comfy. Thank you for staying with me. Let's give it everything we've got! So, how does one start this with a bit of controversy? Ooh, I think I got it! How about by placing a survivor in the bottom spot of this top 10 list? Now, who could it be? Eeny, meeny, miny, you. Hardy har har guys, it's the funny green haired merchant boy! The placement of Teruya Otori isn't by accident. Personally, I love the little shit, but I like the rest of this list more. That being said, here's your resident moron's two cents on the ultimate merchant. I personally consider Teruya to be one half of the comedic relief coin of this game, the other one being Haruhiko. I call them that for reasons that I hope to fully convey in this entry. People often recall their rivalry starting in Chapter 3 that culminates in a massive character development for both but it's easy to overlook the fact that they were always the polar opposites of each other. In the case of the heir of Otori Mart, he brings a brand of pessimism to the comedy of the game, either denying events in a hilarious fashion or just... screeching his lungs out. It does clash pretty vividly with Haru's brand of comedy, which... will be brought up later in this video for sure. In any case, that's only half of his character. While he may be consistently hilarious, even when the situation might demand a little more... seriousness, part of the reason why he's a little lower on the list, I'd say that his other faces are equally as impactful. Whenever the facade of the happy-go-lucky merchant falls, we get a great scene, whether be it when him and Haru have a fallout or just him regretting his actions in Chapter 4. Serious Teruya might be my favorite aspect of his character, which brings me to the point that many have probably have been expecting. We don't really see enough of it. And while that's not necessarily a bad thing with characters like Kinjo around, I think it's more of a hindrance than a positive for Teruya's character. Still, it's not all that bad. I'd say he's a decent blend in the end. But as an aside and being completely transparent with you guys, the idea of the ultimate merchant at the bottom of this list is nothing but incredible to me, because he's better than a lot of the characters from the canon Danganronpa series. But this cast just merits special attention in my opinion. Overall, his character is anything but weak. I find his presence enjoyable throughout the entire game, adding to that the fact that he SOMEHOW survived the entire thing. I'd say he left a good impression on me. It's just that the competition, this time around, is incredibly unfair to him. At least from where I'm standing. 
For now though, there's not much else to say about him. His arc is pretty good, and Repent is seldom done poorly. Out of the survivors though, he's the weakest link. Sorry buddy. What if it was the girl? That's two for two, baby! The bottom two spots of this list are indeed occupied by survivors. Fucking insane, right? No bullshit though, I absolutely love Rei Meikaru. When talking antagonists of the Danganronpa canon, we have some pretty good characters. Nagito, Kokichi, etc. But every once in a while, we have to be reminded that, yes, Byakuya was also an antagonist. And a damn good one at that, although unfortunately overshadowed by the simply superior games that were Danganronpa 2 and V3. HOWEVER, Linuge gave us a superb rendition of the snob character who thinks too much of themselves, in the form of Rei Mekaru, the ultimate professor. Now, those who have followed my Let's Plays of all Danganronpa titles know that I'm usually not too keen on antagonist characters. As people, I mean but they usually rank up pretty freaking high on my top 10s. This time though, we have the complete opposite. Rei invokes my total and utter respect, but she's only number nine on the list. It's crazy, absolutely bonkers that this could even be conceived within my tiny little brain. But here we are. For starters, her character arc heavily mirrors Byakuya's from Trigger Happy Havoc, hence the Eric Andre joke at the start. An absolute prick who looks down on everyone until Satsuki earns her respect by absolutely destroying Monokuma and the killing game with facts, logic, and clown noises. Despite that, and unlike Byakuya, she doesn't really do anything to make me despise her. She's usually calm, collected, and on top of things. I literally can only point the antisocial behavior as a flaw. And it's not even that big, and it's also diminished by learning her backstory. She started as a nobody, and through sheer force of will, she made it to the absolute top. That gave her an outlook on life that not many people can experience, including hatred for people born with talent. So you could call her the anti-Nagito, weirdly enough. Although that info is locked behind her free time events, it's easy to see bits and pieces of that attitude throughout the entire game. And from chapter 5 onward, she just becomes an entirely different beast. I wouldn't say she's my favorite antagonist, quote unquote. That honor's still going to Nagito. But I'd say she seals the top 3 for me right now. Rei just oozes cool for me. Her posture, demeanor, and overall presence is incredible. Whether she's her usual stoic self, or going absolutely batshit insane at someone with unyielding rage. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. In the end, I do respect Rei Mekaru a lot. Unfortunately for her, just like with Teruya, the competition is ridiculous this time around. And because of that, she can't really get any higher than number 9 for me. The light at the end of the tunnel reveals the shining personality of Kyoka Maki, everyone. Add another to the list of first case victims that had a lot of potential. Seriously, Danganronpa, what the hell is up with that? Well, I won't stand for such bullshit, because Kyoka is probably in the top 5 most badass characters in the series. We are not starting there, though. The Ultimate Sniper is one of the most genuinely uplifting characters in this damn game. No exaggeration. I mean, if you're watching this, you probably didn't need a nobody like myself to tell you that. Whenever I uploaded an episode for this Let's Play, or in the later stages, streamed this game, there was always so much love for her, and I can definitely get behind that. Once again, I'm prompted to make a comparison to Trigger Happy Havoc. She is the antithesis of Sayaka when it comes to both of their murder cases. 
While Sayaka's murder was intended to teach the player that distrust is the order of the day, Kyoka was as pure as you could make a character that can handle firearms with more accuracy than... well, anyone. Her killing was more directed towards another character that we'll... get to? Eventually. Back to Kyoka though, this is one of the characters where you need far more than the actual game's appearances to understand just how good she actually is. This girl, underneath that absolutely glowing exterior, is a hopeless romantic with the wish of just getting along with everyone she meets. She also kind of hates her ultimate talent, to the point of not even using it unless absolutely necessary. So it's safe to say she despises any and all violence. And yet, both the flashbacks of Chapter 6 and Danganronpa and other IF show us exactly why such a person earned her title. Quickly now! Ooh! Oh! oh. <laughs> this is so cool! That wasn't me, I didn't make it! Shit, that plays like this. Kinjo! No! No! <laughs> Pop off, Kyoka! Oh! You got it right! How? Well, you were saying that we only needed to avoid the front of that lens to hit it, right? I just located the bullet's angle to bounce it off the. <laughs> Holy shit, Kyoka. So, not only is she an uplifting, happy, and overall great person to be around, but she's basically John Wick in disguise? Is it possible to call this love? Hey! I mean, platonic. It's purely platonic. I, I simply really admire her. <sighs> so, before I get in trouble, I'll just leave you with this. Kiyokamaki deserves better. Hashtag all my homies hate Mitch. <laughs> Till death does them part, folks. See? I told you all that the tie would make a lot of sense. Part of me thought of placing one of them above the other, but I seriously can't bring myself to do it. The mastermind duo of Danganronpa and other, Utsuro and Akane Taira. So this is... technically three separate characters given Utsuro's whole complexion with Yuki Maeda's personality, it's a pretty complicated entry to write. So let's kick things off with... Good God. Akane Taira, ultimate maid. What a roller coaster of a character, ladies and gentlemen. I gotta admit, she had me hella fooled. I felt for her charm and presence like a goddamn idiot. <sighs> Guess Sayaka didn't really teach me anything after all, huh? Never in my wildest dreams did I think Lainuj would pull off something like that at the end of Chapter 5. See, normally, you'd have the Mastermind revealed at the final class trial to the tune of the main Danganronpa riff and all that. You usually don't see... this. Huh? No fucking way. Despite her absolute insane act following that moment, it's easy to forget just who she used to be before that. One of the most loyal friends of the entire cast, able to just lighten the mood with a few simple words every single fucking time. It's simply astounding that from the moment where Mekaru mentioned the Mastermind could have had their memories erased as well, I never once thought it would end up being Akane. And that's because, like I said, Sayaka seemingly taught me nothing. The more I look at this, the more I can draw a parallel to the first case of Trigger Happy Havoc, but in a much larger scale. Speaking openly, I love everything about Akane, from design to personality. And yes, that includes Ultimate Despair Akane as well. And it was incredibly difficult for me to place her this low, but as I've stated many a time by now, 
This cast is freaking ridiculous when it comes to quality. I rarely had bad things to say about her during the Let's Play. That should tell you what I think of her here. I find it, again, pretty complicated to talk about Akane mainly because... Minus her ultimate despair appearance, she's... Not that memorable. Again, don't get me wrong, I love her character! But it's a little like Kibo from V3. Despite being an integral part of the plot and an overall sweetheart, until the heel turn, she's just... kind of there. Helping, sure, but not being outstanding in any way. Well, maybe besides Chapter 4... Ow, 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 stop, ow, ow, stop it, stop <sighs> For personal reasons, I am advised to move on to Utsuro. So, protagonist mastermind, huh? Sounds awfully familiar. It's actually really interesting because there's a damn good argument to call Utsuro a simply better Izuru, and yeah, I, I totally agree with it. I mean, seriously, let's check out a list of things they both have in common. Unemotional, devoid of interest for anything, blind faith in their abilities, the closest thing to a god in their universe. The only difference being that Utsuro was always like that, as opposed to the transformation of Hajime into Izuru, which, believe it or not, makes Utsuro care even less than the so-called ultimate hope of Hope Speak Academy. I gotta say, I really enjoy this nihilistic piece of shit. As Yuki is your typical ultimate lucky student, with stuff bending to his will a little too much every now and then. Don't be ridiculous! Kinjo is not dead! We can't send Kinjo away like this! Fool! See for yourself! You have already, but can you admit it? Look, his heart stopped! Just like this! Stop! <laughs> What? <laughs> However, when he's conscious of his own powers, literally only his own will can make him fail. That's fucking ridiculous. Even more ridiculous than that is the fact that it's exactly that exact chain of events that occurs in Chapter 6's good ending. And honestly, motivation-wise, this character makes a whole lot of sense. Could you possibly imagine that you get everything you desire with so much as a thought? It's pretty easy to make the world feel dull in those circumstances, I feel. And that's precisely what went through the mind of our nihilist. That is, until he met a certain ultimate fashionista. Yet again inspired by Izuru's narrative, Utsuro finds Junko interesting enough to follow her lead, creating a test run of sorts for what would eventually become Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc. Somehow, the self-contained story of Danganronpa Another manages to intertwine itself with the universe of the canon series, and it's all due to the actions of this absolute piece of shit. That's fucking amazing in my books. As a character, but above that, as a mastermind, I find his mere existence to be fascinating. Utsuro is one of those characters that, even though you know pretty much all you need to know about them, it still leaves you wanting more. And I couldn't ask for much more than that. As for the real Yuki Maeda... Well, I suppose you guys will have to wait and see how Danganronpa Another 2 plays out, and what's Utsuro's relation with that game and its mastermind. Until then, the mastermind duo of Danganronpa Another earned themselves the seventh slot in my top ten. In this episode of Psycho Cop. Yeah, it's Kinjo. Holy shit. Seriously, you expect me to be able to describe what makes a character like Kinjo tick? I don't even understand what the motherfucker's feeling half the time. Hatred? Sorrow? Compassion? It's usually not discernible, which really creeps me out most of the time. Allow me to put it this way. Nagito was scary. Kokichi was terrifying. Kinjo was in the realm of man-made horrors beyond comprehension. Well, I can comprehend these man-made horrors perfectly fine, so I don't know, maybe you have a skill issue or something. <sighs> Listen, I know when I reach my limits, alright? And this... This is clearly above my pay grade. Tsurugi Kinjo's whole character is something that I couldn't, 
not even in my deepest, darkest nightmares come up with. How Lineage was able to convey such a thing into a fucking visual novel is far beyond me. I should calm myself and recollect. When the player meets Kinjo in the prologue of the game, he seems... alright. A normal person, although a tad too young to be a policeman. He seems like someone dependable, and that premise made me feel secure about him. During the first chapter, his leadership is crucial, just straight up. Without him, I'm sure at least half of the cast would have felt lost, confused, and that the first killing wouldn't have even needed the motive it had. In fact, during the entire first trial, I kept praising him on his way of thinking. Knowing that killers would likely target him as a way to make the cast have a higher degree of difficulty solving cases, he only provided aid when it was absolutely essential, and I fully respected that. However, when Smitch is outed as the killer and his execution arrives... Well... What the? Are you saying you're glad that Mitch died? Of course. No murderer has the right to live, regardless of how many they've killed. And there's the twist I was waiting for. <laughs> it wasn't on the right character, though. What the fuck, Tsurugi? We just got a letter. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. Wonder who it's from. What the actual shit? What? Yep, seems about right. See, here's the thing. Morals based on justice are fine. What isn't fine is using them as an excuse to not show any kind of consideration for the motives one has to kill. Not to say I didn't feel any sort of anger towards some of the killers in this game. Mitch and Kinji, I'm looking at you. But this fucker takes it way too far. Despite that, he does go through an arc during Danganronpa Another. It begins in Chapter 3 with... Ironically, Kinji Wehara's case. Strange, Kinjo. My logic shouldn't be any different from yours, but you're getting heated, aren't you? Oh, oh shit! Okay, okay, Kinjo, speak! The logic of a killer is the same as mine. What are you talking about? Discard prime numbers for the majority. Isn't that what you said? I sacrificed the lives of 15 people and took the precedence over their lives. Uh, I took precedence over the lives of 100 cathedral children. Of course, that doesn't mean I'm allowed to commit murder. But Kinjo, you put Mekaru Tomori and me in danger, the one, <laughs> the one who went saying the exact same thing? Wouldn't it be necessary to reconsider your stance at least once? Kinjo? He got him! He, he got him! Holy shit, he got him! Uh, yeah? This talk resonates with Kinjo, even if briefly. Why briefly? Uh, it's easy. Chapter 4 exists. Ah, yes. Chapter 4. A part of the game we will surely talk more about later on, but just know that... Yeah, it doesn't help Kinjo's complex. That is... Until the trial. Haruhiko Kobashikawa tried to kill Satsuki Renami. It makes no sense to help him in a situation where it leaves more evidence to the culprit. But, ah, but look here. The victim you had to protect was the reversed. Reverse toward after trying to kill someone? <laughs> they are very good citizens indeed. No. Dude! Okay, yeah, he deserved this fucking awakening for a while now. Oh no! I am. What the hell am I for? For so many days! Many for. Kinjo? Having a complete mental and emotional breakdown, Kinjo's first action in Chapter 5 is... Maeda. In the end, it doesn't matter. It's not a difficult situation. If only I was an ordinary student and not the ultimate police officer. Could I have been friends with everyone? No shot he's gonna die here, right? No way. No. I, no, no. No, 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 no. I refuse to believe he dies here. Kinjo, stop! Okay, maybe I was wrong! Maybe, maybe I was wrong! Okay, maybe I was wrong! I'm going! Now, through the absolutely miraculous power of Utsuro, or at the time, Yuki Maeda, Kinjo survives somehow. And adding to the deus ex machina that is the godlike luck described in the previous entry, he also regains all of his memories. Therefore, Chapter 6 Kinjo is... cool, actually. Really cool. 
Imagine the smarts he had before, but without the psychopathic behavior he displayed, and you have, by far, my favorite version of his character. Shame it's so short-lived, but when confronted by Akane and Utsuro's bullshit, I guess you shouldn't expect normalcy. So, yeah, Kinjo isn't really a one-dimensional character, despite seeming so during the majority of the game. Behind the hardcore crime eradication cop lies a human being who just doesn't know how to properly process his emotions. Of course, not saying I quite forgive some of the stuff he did and said, but I will say, criminals beware if you're anywhere near the vicinity of Tsurugi Kinjo, the ultimate police officer. Also, the first of three characters that make up this game's true ultimate hope. <laughs> Yamato Kisaragi, the 16th student, lying hidden somewhere in the- yeah, okay, this bit's played out. The introduction of this guy into the narrative come chapter 5 is way bigger than people usually recognize. And that goes for any way that you could conceive. It's outlandish what the existence of one singular character can explain. In Danganronpa alone, there are only a handful of characters that fit that role. The most prominent ones being, of course, Junko Inoshima and Chihiro Fujisaki. But Yamato Kisaragi solidly places himself as, without fucking question, the most important character in Danganronpa Another. Actually, scratch that. The Kisaragi family name is the most influential within this universe. I stand by that. Inserting Danganronpa and others' characters and story into the normal Danganronpa canon, which I sort of do, the Kisaragi family is personally responsible for keeping the 79th class alive long enough for the killing game. Although, of course, that wasn't their original intentions. And the man at the head of that is none other than the amnesiac introduced in Chapter 5. <sighs> the ultimate inventor is... How do I put this? He's out there! Obviously there are two phases to his character, but I'll be focusing on his first one, what I like to call the sane Kisaragi phase, quote unquote. And I'm only focusing on that because... Yeah. As for his normal self, I would hazard a guess to say we're facing the single most responsible character in the series. I mean, it's expected? I guess? We're talking about a kid who was trained and prepared all his life to eventually inherit a huge corporation and all of its assets. The Kisaragi Foundation is, by no means, a small thing. Motherfucker out here with top secret facilities and futuristic technology that, mind you, allowed Akane and Yutsuro to create an entire dummy killing game for Junko. So when you get to the flashbacks of the so-called Chapter Zero and this man pulls off stuff like this... What's the situation? You said it's not too late. Do you know something? I don't even have time to relax and explain. Right now, something absurd is happening in Hope Speak Academy. For now, everyone follow me. We have to get out of here right now. Follow you? Where are we going? A laboratory research institute owned by the Kisaragi Foundation. No, I'm not giving up. Oh shit. The weapon. My goodness. Nice, Kisaragi! Direct hit! Yeah, it's pretty wild. Now, I called this man the first third of this game's ultimate hope. What the hell did I mean with that? Oh, it's quite simple. Rather than having a character that represents good within the cast, Danganronpa Another decides to split it into three. My least favorite third appearing within Mr. Kisaragi over here. And it's purely a matter of personal preference. I love all three characters that make up this game's ultimate hope, although differently for each. Anyway, Kisaragi exemplifies the indomitable human spirit, a will to never submit to the whims of despair, no matter how cruel and unforgiving the reality the cast is living in is. Like, imagine being the fucking savior of this game when you're literally dead. Couldn't be anyone else. Oh, right. Yamato has some striking similarities to my baby boy Chihiro Fujisaki, only even more ridiculous given his actual and explicitly stated importance. No wonder I consider him at least partially an ultimate hope, huh? And yeah, like I said, I won't discuss his appearances within the killing game. 
While his memories are there, they are absolutely locked away by brain damage while trying to retain said memories. And it's not even for that long. Sucks to be the most important character only to be the catalyst to remove Makako from the picture, doesn't it? Oh well, one thing nobody will take away from this guy is the title of best ultimate adventure around. HA! Suck it, Mew! Hey yo, Danganronpa! Can I get a character with the perv stereotype that manages to be somewhat likable? Sweet! Thanks! What's that in the sky? It's a bird! It's a plane! No, it's- Oh shit, it is a plane! Seriously, how is Pilot, of all things, not present in a Canon Danganronpa entry? It is seriously such a cool talent. Whatever, I suppose. Anyway... Haruhiko motherfucking Kobashikawa. Good god. I thank Lainuj every day for creating this boy. Which seems like it's countering what I said at the start of the video, but just, shh, just just don't worry about it. I see a lot of myself in Haru. Of course, I'm not as blatantly open to saying shit that'll make me look bad, but I try to look at the world through positive lens whenever possible, something that the pilot boy also does. Whatever the case, this one's certainly special. I can't even exactly say how or why. I just know he is special. And I'm far from the only one who thinks like that. Like I stated in Teruya's entry, Haruhiko completes the comedic duo of the game with our ultimate merchant. And to complete his yin, Haru brings his own yang. Positivity by the gallon, y'all. Meeting him at the beginning of the game will likely give you a big smile. Haru's the bro of the crew, so to speak. Super chill and friendly, almost always with the best interest of his friends in mind. <laughs> but don't confuse that friendliness with wholesomeness. Weren't you wondering why I talked about the perv stereotype? Even in this situation, the poker face is scary. Hey Yugi, don't leave out in ha what happened and let's talk about the things we couldn't do because you didn't do anything. You won't stop being depressed if you keep your mouth shut because you're worried about your family. How about it? Wanna go and sneak into the girls? <laughs> Good to see this man never changed. Yeah, I meant it. But believe it or not, we got ourselves a good implementation of such a character. How, you ask, did Linuj manage to make it work? The answer is so simple that it will absolutely surprise you. Control. Yes, stereotype characters are funny and all, but having some degree of control found in how Haru behaves is absolutely fucking nice. Comparing to Ken and Tang and Rumpa characters, well, Fumi doesn't even need to be stated, but even Kazuichi can't get restrained when sipping for Miss Sonia. But my boy Haruhiko? Nuh uh. A pervert he may be. sometimes. But he only has eyes for one girl in the cast. And he doesn't even simp actively for her. And the crazy thing? This motherfucker has enough riz for her. Sad that such riz was not possible for mortal hands and he had to die upon using it. Yeah, we all knew this was coming. As cool as this guy is, and however much Riz he possesses, nobody who played this game and grew attached to the Ultimate Pilot can escape Chapter 4. The novelty of seeing the surviving cast in literal formal wear for a fucking ball, they were literally ballin', quickly wears off once you realize this is the funhouse all over again. He may be a lovable moron, but... Man, even talking about this is being difficult. Can't wait until we get to later in the video. Anyway, Chapter 4's killing showcases the real reason Haru is in the top 4. This man, despite having many of the tropes of a pervert character in Danganronpa, is entirely pure of heart. He was willing to simply give his own life for someone, without so much as a twitch or an eyebrow raise. And, as you can guess, he did it for love. Your unadulterated love. It's really painful, but I, I really, really like this. 
It just paints Haru in a beautiful light, surprisingly. One that, for me at least, overshadows his comedic counterpart. Without Chapter 4, I'd still like Haruhiko over Teruya, just not as much as this. In the end, I will always hold immense amounts of respect for this boy. No, pardon me. For this man. Le vent se lève. Il faut tenter de vivre. Everyone, presenting the second third of who I consider to be this game's ultimate hope. The power of the ultimate exorcist compels you! The power of the ultimate exorcist compels you! Meet Mikako Kurokawa, everyone. She's not quite best girl of Danganronpa another, but damn if she doesn't get very close to it. Now, you might find it weird that someone who has a horrible case of the mute syndrome is so high up on the list. Ah, who the fuck am I kidding? If you're watching this video, then I'm fairly sure you know exactly how Mikako made it into the top three. Whatever the case is, I welcome this girl onto the list with open arms. It is amazing how this character was written. And the crazy thing is that she doesn't really change all that much between the start of the game and her eventual death in Chapter 5. Well, I don't know if crazy is the right word for it, considering her unique position within the killing game. Let's start from the top, shall we? Upon meeting Mikako, it's clear that this girl is... weird. Her eyes indicate that she's at the very least sad, and needs more calm sleeping sessions. Nevertheless, she was quiet, calm, and polite, introducing herself with no animosity whatsoever. Throughout the game, Mikako is... again, weird. Like I said at the start of the century, she has mute syndrome. Not completely mute, but think Chihiro Fujisaki levels here. Oh god, I just mentioned Chihiro twice in a video about Danganronpa another what is my life? Anyway, I would say that she's suspicious from the get-go. I mean, think about it. Every single action she undertakes until Chapter 5 can be construed as highly dubious, even when she speaks. I was never one to doubt that she was a good person, despite knowing I shouldn't trust anyone in this damn series, but I couldn't deny that fact. However, little bits and pieces of her behavior did lead me to believe that she knew something about our situation. That wouldn't really get picked up until... Yeah, you guessed it. Chapter 5. And brought up by none other than Rei Makaru. All because of the introduction of a certain ultimate inventor. Mikako's reaction to Kisaragi is... telling, to say the least. And Lainuj milks the suspense of the relationship between the two for as long as possible. Well, if you don't know what yamato -ni means, anyway. Thank you, YouTube comments! I tend to attribute later chapters to one, or at most, two characters. For example, I hold the belief that Danganronpa V3's chapter 5 and 6 were Maki's and Shuichi's chapters, respectively. As for this, Danganronpa Another starts all the way in chapter 4, although that'll be addressed later. Chapter 5, however, belongs firmly in Yamato Kisaragi and Mikako Kurokawa's hands. Everything in this chapter is about them, and I love it. And while we don't really get an explanation as to their relationship until Chapter 6, praise be to the way Mikako's character was handled in this chapter, especially during the investigation and trial. Like I said earlier, it's pretty clear from the get-go that Mikako knows more than she lets on. But it really only starts becoming truly apparent that something's off during the trial. Throwing Yuki under the bus was the first thing. Something that maybe should have made you, as the player, think twice. Back then, I just thought it was a desperate attempt to pin the blame on the protagonist by our exorcist girl. But, knowing what I do now, I wonder if she was just doing this because of who Yuki really was. Even so, more than her outburst, the thing I most remember her by... is this. She literally fell apart. I have to tell you about it. The mastermind has been with us in all our events. What? The key. No. Yep. 
a self-sacrifice. Her condition being so bad that despite knowing all about the killing game and who orchestrated it, she could do nothing but look on and mourn the loss of her friends. However, in the end, she refused to die like Monokuma wanted, going out on her own terms. After all, hope never loses to despair. And then, we learn of her true self. Seriously, it's almost time for school. What are you doing sleeping? Our teacher will be here very soon, so get up. I can't even begin to process how painful it must have been to such a cheery and uplifting girl to become distant and emotionless for the sake of simply surviving. Not only that, but believing that your own adoptive brother is fucking dead is insane. Mikako might just be the single strongest character in the game, from an emotional standpoint. And if not... Well, let's just say that she's absolutely tied with someone else. Someone who happens to occupy the next spot on this list. I'll end by saying that I must be a psychic, because all the way back in the first episode of the game, I said I felt like I would want to protect her. And I was absolutely right. And now for something completely different. <laughs> the final third of this game's ultimate hope, everyone. <sighs> Remember when I said I forgot who the real clown of this channel was? Well, turns out, guess we were all wrong, dear viewers. We have, in our present, the biggest clown of them all. Man, oh man, where can I even begin with Satsuki? It's quite telling of a game when one of my favorite characters in it is canonically one of the best clowns in the entire fucking world, isn't it? Don't let that fact fool you guys. I have a mountain and a half to climb before I can even consider comparing myself to the ultimate clown. To understand why that statement is truth incarnate, allow me to take you on a trip. Prologue of the game. As Yuki Maeda begins to meet his classmates, he comes across a girl with blue hair, yellow eyes, and a clown attire. She's a bit of a prankster, but you can tell she's not a bad person. Or at the very least you can assume that. You never know with this game. Her portrayal throughout the story is honestly heartwarming. She might just be one of the most genuinely uplifting and well-intentioned characters in all of Danganronpa. Every single time that Yuki has a talk with Satsuki, it's at least guaranteed that your mood will improve, no matter how little it may be. However, that's not to say that she's not grounded in reality. Sure, she may seem a little aloof and, dare I say it, ignorant, but I can assure you that Satsuki knows precisely what she's doing. If we only had the first three chapters to go off of, I wouldn't be able to say that with complete confidence. But, as you know, Satsuki survives until THE chapter. <sighs> chapter 4. I spoke about it in Haruhiko's entry, but it's time to finally address what makes this my favorite chapter in the game. And yes, I did say favorite. Just because it made me cry like the littlest bitch doesn't mean I can't deny the stroke of genius that was its writing. Before this chapter, Satsuki's presence, albeit hilarious and a source of constant comic relief and wholesomeness, was not that noteworthy. Don't get me wrong, she'd absolutely have made it into this list without chapter 4. Hell, she'd probably be in the top 5 anyways. But this chapter just hits all sorts of different. While chapter 5 belonged to Makako in Yamato, and chapter 6 was firmly in Utsuro and Akane's hands, Chapter 4 focuses primarily on our clown girl. Sure, Haru has a say in it, but Satsuki makes Chapter 4 memorable. For starters, the way she legit doesn't know how to wear a dress is adorable, although a little sad if you really think about it. But once the action starts picking up, she kind of takes a little bit of a backseat. The plot progresses, the characters enter a state of famine, and... Well, shit escalates, and quickly. And then, one fateful night, our little pilot boy Haru discovers the secret prize of the ballroom. With a lovely photo in his hand and a newfound desire to protect the girl he loves, Haru springs into action, telling Satsuki all that he plans to do. Or so she thought. As they prepare to strike each other down in the armory, Aruhiko's weapon backfires, and our clown girl shoots him down. With tears in her eyes, she holds Haru as he explains how he did all of that 
for her. For the chance, however slim, that she would survive the class trial and live on for him. I purposefully left this moment out in Haru's entry, but I'll address it here. Because despite this being his plan, Satsuki steals the fucking show. For starters, the fourth class trial is brutally honest with the player, but in such a clever way. What is it, Hironami? I'm the killer. Huh? Hearing this, it's hard to assume that it's true. I mean, really? When has a Danganronpa game literally spoon-fed you like that? Especially when it comes to class trials. But as the trial progresses, as the evidence is uncovered by the cast, you begin to realize that she's telling the truth. Satsuki Iranami is the blackened of chapter 4. This fact, this simple fucking fact, challenges the perspectives of the entire surviving cast. Minus Mikako, but we've seen why. However, for the rest, Teruya understands that his thoughts and intentions were inexcusable, especially near the end of the chapter. Rei understands that she's been treating people rather harshly, gaining a newfound respect for Satsuki, which blossoms into respect for the rest. Yuki inherits the hope that Satsuki puts onto the rest. Well, until he just doesn't. But without a doubt, the one who's affected the most? Tsurugi Kinjo. The mere thought of a victim sacrificing themselves for their killer's sake is far more than Kinjo can endure, as I've stated in his entry. In the end though, it's Satsuki herself who steals the spotlight. I'm perfectly aware of the length of this section, but I can't help but gush over this character and chapter. Satsuki Iranami has the single best send-off any one character has had in Danganronpa. Period. So, I bet my own hope on all of you. On us? I never wanted much. I'll be leaving this world soon. I just have one thing. No, wait. Please promise me two things. One! Be sure to survive for Kabazing and me. Two! That Monokuma guy? Please give a good beating to that mastermind! Fail full paid revenge! Satsuki-chan, in that regard, I have prepared a very special punishment for the ultimate clown, Satsuki Aranami, for your crime! Come and give it your best shot. I'm not afraid of every of anything like you. My friends will definitely kick your sh your sorry butt. Let's go hard! Punishment time, you bitch! You're just you're just scared of what she was going to say. Kurokawa and Maeda, I didn't get to say anything to you guys, but I'll leave the rest to you guys. Oh, and one more thing, I almost forgot. Kobazing, I love you! Linuj, I tip my hat to you. For making me feel conflicting emotions at the end of a trial. And for creating the character of Satsuki Iranami. She would absolutely be number one on this list. If our Korean friend didn't decide to appeal to my heartstrings with the actual number one. So, I'll end it by repeating Satsuki's signature phrase. Don't forget everyone, hope isn't to be found, it's to be created. To absolutely nobody's surprise. Once you guys saw who number two was, I'd wager that at least 80% of you guys knew exactly who'd top out this list. Ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between, welcome the ultimate surgeon, Kanata Inori. Friendly reminder, once again, that this list is nothing but the opinion of an idiot. That being said, Kanata, my beloved. Those of you who saw my Let's Play of this game might remember a certain comparison I made. Huh. Sorry guys, if, you, if you're wondering why I stopped, this character reminds me of someone. Someone I hold dear to my heart from another franchise. I don't know, I think it's the hair. 
The hair... <sighs> it's not the hair color, it's just the hair. Little did I know, dear viewers, how much I was right. Words fail me once again, guys. Just like when I talked about Kana Kazuchi in my Your Turn to Die Top 10. Kanata might just be the single most wholesome character in the entire series. Of course, you have your Chihiros, Chiakis, Kaedes, etc. But trust me when I tell you that this girl deserves to be up there. Let's begin, alright? I already mentioned the moment we meet Kanata at the beginning of the game. I immediately compared her to Kana, and for good reason. They're both small, have similar hairstyle, and above all, similar demeanor. However, and obviously, Kanata has a lot more life experience, especially considering her talent. I mean, can we fucking consider for like a minute that she's a surgeon? More than working as one of the most difficult medical occupations in the modern world, Kanata's morals are incorruptible. She values the well-being of others more than her own any day of the week. This translates really well into how she behaves during the killing game, as Kanata is constantly worrying over the health of her classmates, mostly mental health, to the point where she blames herself for not being able to prevent killings using her expertise in psychology. She's, for lack of a better word, a total sweetheart. Unfortunately, you all know how Danganronpa works. Wholesome characters have their days numbered. Despite being vital in the first two cases by performing short notice autopsies of the corpses of both Kiyokamaki and Kizuna Tomori, Kanata's time in the spotlight was coming to an end. Welcome, everyone, to Chapter 3. I haven't talked about this chapter yet all that much, but I must say, Danganronpa another breaks an ongoing trend in the series by making Chapter 3 actually good? Great, actually. Of course, that doesn't mean I'm particularly fond of this chapter. And why is that, you ask? Well... Yeah. You know, you'd think I would be desensitized to seeing my favorite characters fucking die by now, but this one... This one was guttural. I had to legit get up and walk away from my computer upon seeing the state of her body. I vividly remembered what was going through my mind as I investigated the double killing of Chapter 3. I kept thinking how this had to have been done with pure malice, as I simply couldn't believe there was any other way someone would intentionally electrocute someone as wholesome and innocent as Kanata like that. Once we find out that it was Kenji, well, let's just say that I thought that hating Kanata's killer would be a lot easier. I really don't like bringing up this part of the game for obvious reasons, but I feel like I have to, just like when I talked about Chihiro all the way back in my Danganronpa 1 Top 10, which came out... Oh, almost four years ago, jeez. Still, such a grotesque figure doesn't do Kanata justice. She's one of the few characters in the series who only takes the best interests of other people at heart, like I said often to her own detriment. Her backstory explains why she behaves like this. Kanata's survival would have been a fatal car crash, which killed her entire biological family because of the kindness and bravery a single surgeon was willing to show for her, performing a near impossible surgery to save the little lass's life. He then takes it a step further by adopting her. From that moment, Kanata decided to dedicate her life to medicine, becoming one of the youngest surgeons in the world and an embodiment of the Hippocratic Oath. So, yeah, if you couldn't tell, not only do I find her adorable, but I also respect the hell out of her for her behavior and moral code. And you wanna know what's crazy, but like really crazy. It was so close to not being that way at all. Lineage's original concept for Kanata would paint her as this wolf in sheep's clothing, becoming the blackened of chapter 2 and revealing an insane side of her during said trial. Supposedly, he wasn't able to go through with that plan because he found his own character too pure to pull a twist like that. And you know what? Yeah, I fully agree. So yeah, thanks Lineage. Again. Fuck, I've thanked this man far too many times in this video. The joke was supposed to be that I hate him, but guess that's out of the freaking window now. In the end, Kanata Inori is special to me. Just like Kana Kazuchi. I suppose that my comparison really was accurate, huh? Let's end this the best way possible, then. And thus, balance was restored. 
At least she's now in the place she belongs, given the angel she is. Rest in peace to you, Kanata, and all the classmates that you lost. Hey, y'all. Bet you didn't think this would come out in your lifetime, did you? All right, all right, I'll admit it. I bit a little more than I could chew. Uh, let's see, your turn to die abridged, TWD, still ongoing by the way, don't stress out. And both Let's Plays going on right now? Yeah, yeah, I think I overdid it a little. Still, we're here, and with a rather lengthy video, I think? Ayo, hey, future me, can you uh, do some, like, stuff? Um, yeah, well, as you can see... It is rather lengthy. You know how my top tens work by this point. I went into Danganronpa Another with an open mind, and holy shit am I glad I did! The Another series has managed to match and, hell, even surpass the original series at points. Yes, looking at you, Chapter 4. I'm currently playing through Super Danganronpa Another 2, so I'm pretty excited to see where that takes me as well. My mind has many questions regarding that particular game, but I'll have them answered by the time that top 10 comes out, I'm sure of it. But yeah, I believe we're done here. If you made it this far, thank you so much for sticking around. And special thanks to those of you who watched this during the premiere. If you liked this video, consider leaving a like and subscribing if you are new to the channel. And if you want to be notified of future uploads like this one, hit the little bell, you know what to do. Also, if you want to join my Discord server or follow me over on Twitch, link to both is in the description below for more content updates. I believe that is all, guys. Stay safe. Thank you for watching once again. And until next time... Peace!